Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm going to do part four uh, on the Bible study on the subject of refuting Paul onlyism, defending Jesus, John, and Peter. If you did not see the first three episodes of this, please go back and watch them. Uh, this will make a lot more sense to you if you watch it from the beginning and you'll understand why uh, I am addressing this problem, uh, why it is a problem, and uh, it'll just make a lot more sense to you if you watch it from the beginning. Now today, I'm going to pick up where I left off. I've been comparing the teachings of the Apostle Paul with the uh, teachings of Jesus. And we, we concluded that the uh, Jesus and Paul both taught easy believism. They both taught the purpose of the law was to show man the impossibility of following it. It would serve as a schoolmaster to teach us uh, we need to just ex accept defeat and say, I can't do it. I need to be saved. And uh, the only way to be saved is putting your faith in the Savior, Jesus. So Paul and Jesus taught the same message. Now let's go on and compare their teachings with others. I'm going to go into the book of John now and see what the Gospel of John says, because one of the things that really offends me so much about Paul onlyism is that uh, uh, I, my favorite book in the entire Bible is the Gospel of John. And I quote it often. Uh, I believe I got saved as I read the Gospel of John. I've actually passed out, like Bible tracts, just this small little booklet. See? It's just a little booklet. But all it is is the Gospel of John. I believe you can get saved by reading the Gospel of John. Most of you probably believe that. But Paul only says, no, you can't get saved by reading the Gospel of John. You can't get saved by reading anything except the writings of Paul. So, as I've said before, even though a Paul Onlyus is a, is a Christian, I don't challenge their status as a Christian. They're saved. And they do believe in this principle that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But they add this tenet, from Paul alone. They believe you can only get saved from Paul's writings. You cannot get saved from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or any other books in the Bible. You can't get saved by the words of Jesus. So uh, I am really offended because uh, I'm tired of these Paul onlyists. Another word for it is hyper dispensationalism or ultra dispensationalism. But I, I, I'm really tired of them continually correcting me and you've probably been corrected too if you dared to even quote john 3 16. they immediately want to correct you and say you can't do that paul didn't write that uh i believe i can pass out a, a gospel of john uh booklet and use it and they can be saved by reading it so uh, i'm going to uh, now compare uh, what is written in the Gospel of John with what I did earlier in the last episode, the, t the teaching of Jesus and, and Paul. I already determined that Jesus and Paul both taught easy believism and the law was only a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So now let's go on and look more at the, the Gospel of John here. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to understand that in the book of John, the word believe in one form or another appears 99 times in the King James Version. So over and over and over again, we see in the book of John 
this the premise that you must believe he that believeth uh, the believers and so on 99 times it says this is what is required to believe uh, I don't know if you're aware of this but the, the word repent which has been hijacked by lordship salvationists and uh, misused but uh, if you think that repenting is a necessity for salvation then I, I wonder uh, how many times in the book of John is the word repent because if, if believe is there 99 times and we must believe and repent then repent should be there 99 times too I mean you should always say you must repent and believe you must repent and believe over and over again every time you both says believe the word repent should be right there alongside it right if there's a dual requirement repent and believe if and I'm using repent as a lordship salvationist would use it that mean they think repent means to <clears throat> uh, stop sinning change your life clean up your life and then you can put your faith in Jesus uh, or change your attitude about sin and at least make up your mind that uh, you know you're gonna do your best and try to stop sinning but so it seems to me that if that was uh, repenting of your sins was required for salvation that it must be um, conjoined with believe every time we see believe we should also see repent so in the Gospel of John we see believe 99 times we see the word repent zero times in the book of John I also while I'm on the subject I uh, will tell you that in all of Paul's writings he only used the word repent one time and I believe it's in 2nd Corinthians when he wrote them he says I do not repent of what I said in my first letter to you uh, so the Apostle Paul never taught that you've got to repent of your sins and then then you can believe in Jesus uh, he only used the word, word repent one time and he was saying that he did not repent he was not sorry he didn't hadn't changed his mind about sending them the first letter that was was quite harsh to the, the Corinthians so we don't see Paul using the word repent we don't use see uh, uh, the Gospel of John using the repent word repent at all but we see believe 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 over and over again so let's look at some of these verses in John let's go to John 10 30 it says I and my father are one then the Jews took up stones again to stone him Jesus answered them many good works have I showed you from my father for which of those do ye stone me the Jews answered him saying for a good work we stone thee not but for blasphemy and because that thou being a man makest thyself God so if if you're a Muslim or if you're someone that just says well Jesus was a good man and he was a prophet and he was a great moral teacher but you know he was not God he's not the son of God then um, th this verse tells you that the at in real time when Jesus was walking and preaching at that very time the controversy was Jesus was claiming to be God and that's why the Jews wanted to stone him and kill him and eventually that's why he was put on trial for blasphemy because he claimed to be God as we'll see here so it says he says I and my father are one so uh, he's claiming to be God also and the Jews understood what he meant by that and they said you're just a man being a man you make us thyself God so there's the controversy there and we see that in the Gospel of John we see that the teaching that Jesus is God he's not merely a prophet now let's go down to John 6 38 for I came down from heaven this is Jesus speaking saying he he came down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him that sent me and this 
is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Two important things we want to learn from these verses is that uh, Jesus says he came down from heaven. Uh, so he, he did not originate on earth as I did. I was born here on earth. I've never lived in heaven. I've never been in heaven. He says he was in heaven and he came down from heaven to not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me, the will of the Father. And he said, what is the will of the Father? That... Uh, that uh, everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. So we see, again, Jesus' claim that he came from heaven, and then also that by believing on him, you get everlasting life. So we're learning from the book of John that Jesus is God, and that by believing on him, we receive everlasting life. You're going to see here, as I proved earlier in the last uh, study that Jesus, Peter, and John are all teaching easy believism. Uh, now let's go to John 1, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is John the Baptist identifying Jesus. As he sees Jesus, he points out to him, he says, behold, that's the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God means that uh, he would be sacrificed. See, when you're identified as the, as the Lamb, the, the, the Jews' custom was to sacrifice the Lamb. They had all these sacrifices uh, in place in Judaism, and everybody knew that when Jesus was identified as the Lamb of God, it means identifies him as the sacrifice. So he says, John is declaring that he is the Lamb of God. He's the one that would be sacrificed. And it says, he says, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now we go to John 12, 32. And if I, and I, this is Jesus speaking, and I, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This is he, this he said, signifying what death he should die. See, so the argument here is Paul Onius say the essentials for salvation is um, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Uh, Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day. And this is what we've got to believe in for our salvation. They say this is unique to Paul. You can only learn this from Paul. And some of them not only say all uh, Paul's writings, Romans to Philemon, but some of them narrow it down even further and say only in this one verse can you be saved. So the content of the verse, the death, burial, and resurrection, the question I'm asking is can we find this anywhere else and i've shown that we find we find that all through the scriptures as i said in the last study jesus and paul both went through the scriptures which are the old testament the the law and the prophets moses and the prophets and they use all that to say uh this is not new pa paul's message that uh, the messiah would come and and suffer and die and be resurrected that is in all the Old Testament writings. So it's it's not origin does not originate with Paul. It's not exclusively in Paul's writings. And right here, Jesus is saying that this he said, signifying what death he should die. If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself. Lifted up from the earth is and it says signifying what death that he should die, obviously we can see that he's talking about his crucifixion. He's nailed to the cross. He dies on the cross. He's lifted up on that cross. And he says, when he's lifted up on the cross in that way, he will draw all men 
to himself. Again, this verse also is an anti-Calvinist verse because he says he's going to draw all men, not just a select few, as the Calvinists uh, claim. So we have uh, Jesus right here speaking about, uh, and John the Baptist talking about, he would be sacrificed, he would be uh, die for the sins of the world. Uh, now, let's look at John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. I discussed this thoroughly in the last study. <clears throat> Again, this is proving <clears throat> that uh, the only requirement for salvation is to believe on Jesus. Paul answered the question, What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. Jesus answers the same question, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? He says, believe on him whom he has sent. So we, we see that Paul and Jesus are agreeing in this message that all that's required is to believe on Jesus. And we look at John 3.36 next. He says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I'm giving you just a sampling of all the belief verses in, in the Gospel of John. But over and over again, we see that this is the condition for salvation. Uh, the Calvinists have this acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, and the, the U stands for unconditional election. Uh, they, they claim there's no condition for salvation. God just zaps certain people and makes them saved. And what they might not even know they're saved. God's already zapped them and regenerated them, and then they, they end up believing. But the scriptures say there is a condition. And it says right here in John 3, 36, what the condition is. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So we can see that the condition is, if you believe on Jesus, you have everlasting life. If you never put your faith in Jesus, if you never believe, then you will not see life. You won't have everlasting life. And of course, John 3, 16, 17, 18, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth, now whosoever believeth, whosoever means any person, so again, this is an anti-Calvinist uh, uh, term. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish. This is showing us easy believism, that all that's required is believing. We don't see anything, any other requirement along with believe, like repenting of your sins or only, but it's easy believism. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Again, we see here in verse 18, this contrast between who, he who believes and who, who doesn't believe. That is the sole condition for salvation. He that believeth on, on him, that's Jesus, is not condemned. I believe on Jesus Christ. Therefore, I'm not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Uh, before I believed on Jesus, I was condemned. When I put my faith on Jesus, I believed on him, I'm no longer condemned. Instead, I have everlasting life. So the only condition is believing. Just as Paul said, just as Jesus said, the book of John teaches easy believism. Um, now, let's look at some other books. Uh, 1 John 5.20 And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So we see in 1 John, the teaching that Jesus is God and eternal life. 
these are the these are the doctrines that a person uh, I believe a person uh, must understand and, and believe these are the core doctrines of Christianity Jesus is God we receive eternal life by believing in him and because it's eternal life it can never be lost otherwise we couldn't call it eternal life now let's look at first John 2 2 and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world well the propitiation means that uh, he, he, he is the full payment now we know that he paid for the sins by suffering and dying on the cross so this verse is telling us that because he died on that cross for our sins propitiation is is done Jesus as he died on the cross says it is finished uh, the the payment of the sins for the whole world is completed it's a satisfactory payment that the sin is debt is paid in full uh, and it says not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world so this is another anti-calvinist verse that says that uh, jesus paid for the sins of everybody not just an elect few let's look at mark 10 45 for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many so if first corinthians 15 3 and 4 says the death burial and resurrection is the the essential for salvation are we getting that from the gospel of john are we getting that in first john it says here he's the propitiation for our sins that's talking about his death and payment for our sins uh in mark 10 45 it says to, he came to give his life as a ransom that's talking about his death for our, and payment for our sins we do not find the, the death of jesus and the sacrificial death of jesus only in paul's letters and obviously uh, if he was if he was dead we know that he was buried and then we're, you're going to see the resurrection in in these other books too let's look at mark 16 21. from that time forth began jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and rate and be raised again the third day this is matthew the gospel according to matthew if you're a Paul only is and you're claiming that you can't get saved in Matthew it's only for the Jews and well it has the same content as Paul's writing it has the same content as 1 Corinthians 15 3 and 4 he's talking about Jesus is saying right in Matthew how he would suffer many things from the elders chief priests and scribes he would be killed and be raised from the raised again the third day that's saying the same thing as first corinthians 15 3 and 4. so the message of paul the message in first corinthians is not exclusive it's all over the scriptures it's in all the gospel accounts it's in some of the other epistles it's in the old testament all throughout the old testament jesus and paul quoted the old testament over and over again just to show what uh was prophesied and claim now you see it's fulfilled jesus is the one that fulfilled all these prophecies he's the one that died for our sins he's the one that was raised from the dead let's look at luke 9 22 and he said this is jesus speaking the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life don't tell me his death burial and resurrection is only in paul's letters don't tell me it's only in first corinthians 15. jesus talked about it all through these various uh gospel accounts now let's look at second peter 1 1 simon peter a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those uh, who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours 
So Peter here is declaring to those who have, who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Peter's declaring that Jesus is God and Savior. These are essential doctrines that we get from Second Peter. Jesus is God Almighty. He is Savior. Scriptures also tell us that there's one God, there's one Savior. And it says that Jesus is the Savior. So we know that Jesus is the Savior God. Let's look at Titus 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Uh, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope that the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we see Peter and Paul here agreeing that Jesus is God and Savior. So we can see that Jesus, John, and Paul all teach the death, burial, and resurrection. And if the death, burial, and resurrection is essential for our salvation, uh, we, we have to say that it's not only found in Paul's letters, it's found all through the Bible. If Paul's letters were all removed from the scripture, people could still get saved by reading all the other writings. Of course, don't take me out of context. I didn't, I'm not saying to remove them. I'm not saying to discount Paul. I, I love Paul above all the other apostles. I value his writings, but don't go to such an extreme that you remove everything else and discount everything and diminish everything else. The words of Jesus, the, the other gospel accounts and say, that's not to us. Just concentrate on Paul's writings, that's all. Never quote the Gospel of John. Never quote John 3.16. That's what I hear from these Paulonius. Now the question is, uh, when Jesus, when I talked uh, a lot last time about uh, how Jesus on the road to Emmaus went through the Old Testament and quoted all the scriptures that were about him, about his death, burial, and resurrection, and uh, uh, and also Paul was, was a, it was his manner it was routine that he would go into a city and find a synagogue and talk to the Jews first and he would go through the scriptures the, the Old Testament Moses and the prophets and he would show them all the prophecies and show that Jesus fulfilled them they, they, in the Old Testament he showed that there would be a death burial and resurrection and uh, you find that much of that in uh, I, book of Isaiah, chapter 53. I'm not going to read it now, but I urge you, if you've never read uh, Isaiah, chapter 53, and Psalms, chapter 22, if you've never read those, you, you've really missed out. Please go and read Isaiah, chapter 53, Psalm 22. These are graphic, detailed accounts now, Isaiah uh, was written 700 years before Jesus. There's uh, fantastic prophecies there that are so clear. So these are prophetic verses that also show us the power of the, the Bible to uh, predict the future, and which gives us confidence that this is the word of God, because how can you predict the future that accurately unless it's through God? So uh, these are also proof texts for the uh, uh, authority and truthfulness uh, of the scriptures. So Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, please go read those as soon as possible. Now, here's another question. Are you born again? Do you believe that uh, in order to be saved, to be a Christian, to go to heaven, you must be born again. Do you believe that? Well, let's see what the scriptures say. say. If, if we must be born again in order to go to heaven. Let's look at John chapter 3, verse 3. 
Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you're not going to go to heaven unless you get born again. So I know that being born again uh, happens when you believe on Jesus. So everything that Paul said and everything I've discussed previously that Jesus had said and, and, and the other apostles, when they're talking about believe, 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 the result of believing is being born again as a child of God. But what is born again? And and is it is it essential? Is it, uh, can you go to heaven if you're not born again? Jesus says no. He says, except, that means unless a man is born again, unless you get born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you get born again, you're not going to heaven. So Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Sounds like a strange question, you know. I mean, no, of course. I mean, how can we go back into our mother's womb when you're a grown man and be born again? That's a, but it's also, uh, I think that question there is is very helpful for us to, to understand eternal security. Uh, it's impossible to go back and get, be born again. You know, once you're born again, it, you're born into the world. You're you're a person, and nothing can change that. You 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 cannot go back and be unborn, and back into your mother's womb and be unborn. And just as we're born again spiritually. We cannot go ever become unborn again spiritually. It's it's done, and it cannot be reversed. Other scriptures say that it's irrevocable. So Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. So Jesus is telling Nicodemus that when he says you must be born again, he's not talking about being born again physically. It's a spiritual birth. You're being born from above, as he said, and uh, born of the spirit. And uh, we know that you're born again when you put your faith in Jesus. You become uh, the Holy Spirit. You're baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells the believer. The Holy Spirit seals the, holy, the, the believer. And so from the moment you're born again, all the way until your death, there's, you never have to worry or question that uh, they can be reversed. Now let's look at 1 Peter 1.3. This is the NASB version. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So here we have Peter uh, using the term born again. And Jesus says we must be born again. Uh, and so it says to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
So we have in First Peter, Peter preaching, you must be born again, and the, he's preaching the resurrection of Jesus. Now, obviously, Jesus couldn't be resurrected unless he died. It says right here, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we've got the death, burial, and resurrection preached right here in 1 Peter 1.3. Not only the death, burial, and resurrection, but the idea of being born again, agreeing with Jesus that you must be born again. Um, and... Now, let's look at 1 Peter 1.23, KJV. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So again, in 1 Peter 1.23, Peter uses the term being born again. So Peter is agreeing with Jesus using this term being born again. Now, the term born again, uh, we can find it in the, in the Gospel of John. We can find it in 1 Peter, but we don't find that in any of Paul's letters. Are, are we going to conclude that because Paul didn't use the term born again, as Jesus and Peter did, that Paul's writings are nullified because he doesn't have the term born again? I don't think so. Uh, but I do find it interesting that uh, the idea of being born again and this death, burial, and resurrection, we see it in Peter's letters, we see it in the Gospel of John, we see it in Matthew, we see it in Mark. We see it all through the Old Testament. So that's the that's the point I really want to make, is that when Apollonius tells you to ignore all the other writings of the scriptures and uh, only the writings of Paul apply to us for salvation, only Paul's letters are to the church, only through Paul's letters can you be saved. The gospel is only found in Paul's letters. The gospel is only declared in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. When you hear those kinds of claims, uh, I hope now, by if you listen carefully to this study, you can see that it's, it's easily disproven. Over and over again, I've shown you that the Paul, Paul's message, uh, uh, easy believism and that the the law was only a schoolmaster not for salvation just the law was there simply to teach us that uh, we are lost and need to be saved that message of Paul is the same message that Jesus taught John Peter Moses and uh, the the prophets Isaiah and David in the Psalms so I think that's settled. Um, if you, I hope Paul Olius watches this, uh, watches this whole state very completely and with an open mind. You see, what I've done in my life, I've been saved 28 years, and my core doctrines that Jesus is eternal God Almighty, that salvation is a free gift through faith alone in Christ alone. And that once we're saved, we can never lose our salvation for any reason. These core doctrines have never wavered over 28 years. However, uh, I've been blessed to uh, talk to and study uh, other opinions on all kinds of theological questions, eternal torment in, in hell, Bible translations, the rapture, dispensations, on and on, the, the Trinity versus modalism, all these different things and many more. 
uh, I've been willing to have conversations with people who disagreed with me. And I've listened. I've given them a fair hearing. And there have been a few times over the years where they persuaded me. And I changed my mind and now I'm on their side of that minor doctrine. There's been a few times where through talking with respect and courtesy and honestly listening to each other, someone listened to me and they were persuaded and they joined my side of this question. But what's required for any of that to happen, that kind of learning to, to take place is you, you must be willing to listen and give someone a fair hearing. Uh, I don't see that happening with the Paulonius that I've, I know. I don't see any of them really actually listening, being willing to listen. It seems like they're so brainwashed, so ensconced in this doctrine uh, that uh, I, I hope that at least one of you, if you're a Paulonius, I hope at least one will, with an open mind, go through this entire study and see that Paulonism is, is obviously false doctrine. So let me try to conclude and kind of sum up everything in the study. I, in the very beginning, I quoted uh, uh, Harry Ironside, Christian scholar H.A. Ironside, 1876 to 1951. <clears throat> he wrote an article refuting hyper-dispensationalism many years ago. I'll quote it again, quote, having had most intimate acquaintance with Bullingerism as taught by many for the last 40 years. Now, first thing to understand from this is that uh, he lived from 1876 to 1951. So let's say that he was writing this in, say, 1930, uh, 1920. And he said for 40 years, this has been going on. That would get us to like the end of the 19th century. So about the end of the 19th century is when this Bullingerism, because Bullinger, E.W. Bullinger is the one that kind of made this idea popular uh, of hyper dispensation of what I call Paul Olingism. So he says, uh, Having had most intimate acquaintance with Bollingerism as taught by many for the last 40 years, it has divided Christians and wrecked churches and assemblies without number. It has lifted up its votaries in intellectual and spiritual pride to an appalling extent, so that they look with supreme contempt upon Christians who do not accept their peculiar views. Well, Harry, Ironside, if God allows you to hear me now, I want you to know I agree with you. I've seen the same thing in my experience. These Paul Onius, they have this attitude where they want to push this doctrine and cram it down everybody's throat. And if you're not a Paul Onius and you quote anything apart from Paul, you must be corrected. You must be straightened out. You must learn to, quote, rightly divide the word as they define rightly divide, which means everything's excluded with Paul. And they've caused divisions in churches. For, for several years, I kept my mouth shut because I wanted peace with them. I loved them as saints. But as they continued diminishing the gospel of John, which I love, when they continued diminishing the red letters, the words of Jesus Christ himself, which I love, and saying they're not to us. And you can't get saved by that. By that. I finally had to take a stand and say, no, I can't keep my mouth shut any longer. I have to make everybody understand that Paul Onlyism is wrong. Don't fall into that trap. And if you're a Paul Onlyist, I pray that through this teaching, you can see the light and see that it's, it's crazy. And it's peculiar, as Harry Ironside said. And 
he says, in, they have intellectual and spiritual pride to an appalling extent. And they, they look with cont supreme contempt upon Christians who do not accept their peculiar beliefs. That's what I've seen. I've seen spiritual pride that they're the only ones that are rightly dividing and that uh, you better conform. Otherwise, you poor thing, you're just some poor ignorant person that can't understand the scriptures. And so that they have this superiority complex and look down on everybody else who doesn't hold that, that viewpoint. So uh, in Wikipedia, it says hyperdispensational exists in different intensities with E.W. Bollinger, an Anglican clergyman and scholar being the best known early expositor. I talked about how uh, there are several positions about uh, when the church began. To me, it is very clear and obvious the church began in Acts 2, where uh, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit first indwelled and sealed the, the believers. Uh, that's the majority position. Most people, that's their traditional position. The church began at Pentecost. But the Paulonists say, no, those people were not Christians. They're not in the church. None of the apostles are in the church. Uh, and uh, the church didn't begin until the middle of Acts when Paul was on the road to Damascus and Paul got saved. And, I, and then some of them even take what they call ultra dispensationalist position, which is, no, the church didn't even begin until Acts 28 when Paul was in prison and because Paul wasn't even teaching the right thing until he was in prison at the end. And then he got this revelation and he started teaching the true message. Uh, so, you no, know, the church began at Pentecost. It didn't believe, began at uh, Paul's conversion. It didn't believe, began later on when Paul was in prison. In Galatians 1.13 says, for ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So right here in this verse, we can see Paul saying that uh, when he was persecuting the church before he ever got saved, when he was a, uh, a Pharisee, and when he was given the task of finding all these uh, believers in Jesus and persecuting them, he calls them, I persecuted the church of God. So Paul declares right there that the church existed even when he was a Jewish uh, Pharisee. The church already existed. He also says in Romans 16, 7, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. So he refers to them as apostles. And, but most importantly, he says, who were, who also were in Christ before me. So he's saying that Andronicus and Junia, they were in Christ before him. So Paul right there is declaring that there were people who were in Christ. Christians. The church, part of the church before Paul. Paul only has opened up your eyes. If you think Paul was the beginning of the church, he was the first member of the church, that's crazy. Even Paul is, is stating in these two verses here that the church existed before he, jo he, he joined it. When they talk about rightly dividing, I showed in the, the, uh, the, the Greek uh, definition of it, it is really is it says accurately handling. The, the Paul only is, are all King James onlyists. Now, not every King James onlyist is a Paul onlyist. But I do believe all Paul onlyists are King James onlyists. And one of the reasons for that is this verse about rightly dividing the Word of God. And when it, but the translation on that uh, in, in King James says rightly dividing, but the Greek says accurately handling accurately explaining and as brother sebastian dresden suggested to me instead of thinking in terms of dividing the scriptures 
it makes more sense to think in terms of rightly uniting the scriptures as I've been, as I've done in this whole study, showing you the unity, the continuity of the scriptures, showing you that the bloody trail of Jesus. I have a, a playlist called the bloody trail and I show all through from the Genesis all the way through the end of the scriptures, the death, burial and resurrection from Genesis all the way through and showing that the scriptures are united and agree with this message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, I also showed that the only real division in the scriptures is the Old and New Testament. Uh, it's, uh, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. This is Hebrews uh, verse 16, I forgot what uh, chapter it is, uh, where a testament is, there must also be of necessity be the death of the testator. So we, we learn there that the, 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 the testament, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the dividing point is the death of the testator, Jesus. So at the cross is where the Old Testament ended and the New Testament began. Now the church didn't begin until maybe a few weeks later when at Pentecost, God gave them the Holy Spirit. Uh, I showed in a study that Moses said that the purpose of the law, see, see Paul Onlyus and some other dispensationists, they teach that uh, we get saved today by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone, no works. But they say that in times past, before Jesus, the times of the law, and even times before that, they, they had to get saved through works. But I show that Moses said the works were not for salvation. The, the works, following the commandments and doing works, the purpose of it was to prosper and be kept alive. So nowhere in the scriptures does it teach that through works we get saved. Uh, yeah, I also showed that Jesus said that it's impossible to get saved through works. I showed that Paul said it's impossible to get saved through works, that the law was only a schoolmaster to show us our sinfulness, so we understand we need to be saved. Let's look at Hebrews 11, three, verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now, this is another thing that Paul only is like to uh, claim for Paul exclusively that Paul had this mystery, no one else had it, and that the mystery was you didn't have to get saved by works anymore. Now you get saved by grace. So this is the age of grace. But they're wrong. Grace has existed from Adam to the present time. It's always been by grace alone, through faith alone. The mystery is not that, oh, now we don't have to work for salvation. It's a free gift. That's not the mystery that Paul learned. As he says here in Hebrews 11, he says, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles. First of all, he says holy apostles and prophets. Uh, so the other apostles understood this mystery too. He, sa he says right here, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Then he says in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So there you have it. Paul only has stopped claiming that the mystery Paul revealed was now we're in the age of grace. Now, the mystery Paul revealed is verse six. He says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. See, the Jews understood, did not understand that Gentiles would be part of it. They, 
they dis, they, they segregate themselves from Gentiles. They discriminate against Gentiles. They didn't want to have anything to do with Gentiles. And now the, this mystery that they didn't understand is Paul, Paul saying, look, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, the same body. So if Paul, if Paul only is tells you that, no, there's two groups, there's the church and then the, the gospel of the kingdom that's just for the Jews, it's wrong. Paul says, no, we're the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So the gospel of grace, the gospel of the kingdom, the same gospel, as I proved earlier in the study. Luke 17, 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom is not a gospel and not a, uh, a belief in Jesus setting up an earthly kingdom. That, Jesus says, no, the kingdom of God is within you. It's a spiritual kingdom. He says, uh, uh, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say low here or low there. You cannot see it it's because it's not a physical thing. It's not a place. It's not a land like Israel. It's spiritual. So if Paul only has to tell you that the gospel of the kingdom is different for, and the Jews have a different gospel and it's the God promise that they're going to have an earthly kingdom, that's wrong. Let's look at Galatians 3.26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So if a Paul only as tells you that there's a different gospel for Jews in Gentiles. There's a different uh, uh, body, the body of Christ. And then the, the Jews have a different, they call it the bride of Christ. They think the bride of Christ is not the church. They think that's just for the Jews. That's their gospel of the kingdom. But Paul denounces that. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Ye are all one in Christ. He couldn't be any more clear. There's only one group, not two. It's the church. Peter preached free grace to Gentiles even before Paul did it. As I proved earlier, Acts 15, 7, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said unto them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel, the, 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 hear the word of the gospel and believe. So I proved that not only was Paul not the only gospel, the only uh, uh, apostle to the Gentiles, but he was not even the first. Peter did this years before Paul, when he preached to Cornelius. And he claims right here, he says, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. So, in fact, it's not just Paul and Peter preached to the Gentiles. I proved that all the apostles were apostles to the Gentiles. Uh, I proved that Paul taught easy believism and the law was our schoolmaster. I proved that Jesus taught easy believism and the law was our impossible. It was there only to show us our sinfulness and our need for salvation. I, showed, I proved that the book of John taught easy believism. Uh, Jesus, John, and Paul all teach the death, burial, and resurrection. And being born again verses are only found in John in 1 Peter, not in Paul's letters. So that's the conclusion of this study. And I started uh, by saying in each one of these sessions, all four of them, that if you're a Paulonius, 
you're 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 not my enemy i'm not calling paulinius a cult i'm not calling them unsaved uh i'm saying you're saved you believe in easy believism you believe jesus is god almighty you believe we're saved uh, by faith alone in christ alone you believe in his death burial and resurrection you believe all the things i believe but you believe you can only learn it from paul and i've proven you wrong completely all right i look forward to all your comments and so if you have put your faith in jesus completely if you do not put your have not put your faith in yourself trying to work your way to heaven if you've rejected that idea and understand that the only way to have eternal life in heaven is to put your faith completely on jesus and no longer believe in your own ability to follow religion if you've done that if you believe on jesus then i call you brother sister saint and uh, i hope that now you can also learn to rest because jesus promised you eternal life and he is faithful god does not lie so you can be confident and rest in the knowledge and security that you have eternal life bless you all in the name of our great savior god his name is jesus christ